Elizabeth Richardson is a registered environmental health specialist and registered sanitarian and works for Coconino County Health and Human Services as a division manager overseeing environmental health, animal management, vital records, smoke-free Arizona, and forensic interviewing. Her degree is in environmental science from Texas State University, and she has been working for Coconino County for seven years. Her environmental health team consists of 10 people total and seven inspectors. Coconino County is in the mountains of Northern Arizona and is home to the Grand Canyon. It is the second largest county in the USA. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Let's see if I can do the screen sharing. Thank you for joining us today. It's nice to see you again. It's great to see you. And Corey, thank you so much for the invitation. I want to thank Shana as well and just ADHS in general. This um, will be my eighth conference I've been attending since 2015. And I appreciate so much the opportunity to um, just share um, and also to attend over the years. So thank you. Um, I also want to thank Catherine Del Mundo if she's here from the FDA because she um, encouraged me to give this presentation for the FDA and we actually met at a conference and discussed it. So I don't think this would be happening right now without her. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and get started. So can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So Corey uh, gave a bit a very nice introduction, but also uh, here's my contact information in case you need it. And also a fun fact about this story about me, uh, about this outbreak that happened in the Grand Canyon is that I had been in my new position for just three months as a division manager when this outbreak happened. So it was a lot earlier on, but I learned a lot as well. Okay, let's get into it. Uh, this picture is really representative of what everybody dreams about when they think about going to the Grand Canyon. The, the boat uh, that is on the river, uh, the, the tent that's close to the river, camping, and it's a huge dream for people all over the world to come to the Grand Canyon. So nearly 6 million people visit the Grand Canyon every year. Uh, it's, as I've mentioned, it's an international tourist destination. Our county, Coconino County, um, assists the canyon with foodborne illness outbreak investigations. We also uh, inspect river guide warehouses, conduct education concerning food preparation, um, and we give education to the river guides on being safe in the back country. So in a normal year, we may get around three norovirus outbreaks and sometimes even none. So in 2022, it was definitely not a normal year. So basics, um, many of you may know this already, but just to kind of as a refresher, norovirus um, is a common cause of gastroenteric illness um, and its incubation period is very short from 12 to 48 hours. The duration of the illness is usually 12 to 72 hours. And we see large outbreaks every year commonly at restaurants and cruise ships. We don't really think about the Grand Canyon or outdoor sites. So why is it so difficult to stop it? Um, infected individuals shed the virus at high concentrations in feces and also in vomit. It only takes a few virus particles to become infected. Not everyone who's infected shows symptoms, and I think that's huge, especially in this case. 
uh, common backcountry sanitation practices of using hand sanitizer isn't great at killing norovirus. Uh, water filters will get into this a lot more in this presentation, used for backpacking, do not remove norovirus. Uh, the virus can stay alive in water, food, and surfaces for a long time, and some people have speculated even on the beaches in the canyon, uh, norovirus can spread through the air. Okay. I thought this graphic was great. It's from the CDC, but it, it kind of presents some of the challenge that we're talking about today. Um, these pictures are, it's a great infographic and it talks about how people get norovirus, but you they're almost all indoor type pictures um, or a safe indoor setting. And you wouldn't, you know, you. Again, you wouldn't just assume that you could get this in the Grand Canyon. Something again to bring up is this uh, incubation period of 12 to 48 hours. Okay, so this is how this first came to me on April 18th in an email. At 3.42 p.m., the end of the day, I received an email with this subject in the headline, uh, one positive COVID-19 case and seven passengers exhibiting vomiting and nausea symptoms um, on a river guided trip. And so this wasn't unusual. It was, it was a little bit early in the season. Um, usually we don't start seeing that till more in May, sometimes even June. So April was a little early, uh, but not unprecedented. Um, I I do not envy the people on this trip because it seems like they had to deal with both COVID and, and Noro. <laughs> All right. So this email began our investigation into norovirus, and um, this would infect several hundred people and last over the next three months. I had no way of knowing this at the time. If I had, I probably would have ran and cried. <laughs> All right, uh, the email said the following. Um, there was a confirmed COVID-19 positive case on the trip. Uh, the individual was exhibiting mild symptoms and tested positive. Um, additionally, there were six individuals on the trip who were experiencing vomiting and nausea. Uh, to err on the side of caution, staff were treating these cases as suspected neurovirus and heightened cleaning and sanitization. All of this is standard operating procedure. They're old pros at this. They know how to work through norovirus. And you'll see some of the standard operating procedures as we go through this presentation. So some of the things on this trip that I think are interesting and just kind of represent representative of how it works, there was 28, 28 passengers, four crew members, um, this trip was for approximately 10 days. The launch date was on April 5th. Uh, the trip exchange date was on the 9th. And if you didn't, if you don't know, and I didn't know really before I began this, an exchange date is a date where um, maybe more people will come onto the boat. Um, new people and passengers enter and, and come onto the boat. Sometimes people who are on the boat leave, um, but it's an opportunity. It's kind of almost like a, a gate. New people come on, some people leave. And we've noticed that during the exchanges, this is a time often when um, viruses are introduced. So the trip end date was on April 16th and it was a motorboat trip. All right, so this is kind of a cool timeline and I'm not gonna go over every bit of this and I've got the same slide at the end to go into it in more detail, but I think some of the things that are really interesting here are again that uh, April 8th was the first date when we got a notice. This would go on until July 7th, 2022. And some key points here on May 10th, alone, we had five trips in one day that were infected with neurovirus, and that was huge. 
around this time, we had over 100 documented reports of neurovirus. Um, we eventually had to call the CDC into this investigation. Um, we certainly worked very much with, with people from the state um, in the county, our epidemiology division and our communicable disease division. Um, and, and I'll also get into more of how we split up tasks and how we work through all of this. Okay, uh, the geography comes pretty strongly into play here as well of the upper Colorado River as it runs through the canyon. Uh, most trips begin at Lee's Ferry, and that is mile zero, and conclude at Whitmore Wash, mile 188. Over the course of these 188 miles is where this neurovirus outbreak happened. And we wound up needing to get samples from this area. That's 188 miles of neurovirus samples and just a lot of samples. <laughs> All right, this is a picture of it. And um, this is the area um, in Northern Arizona that we're talking about at the Arizona and Utah border. Um, most people get on at Lee's Ferry, which is mile zero. Phantom Ranch is a place where a lot of people get water and get off, uh, camp on a beach. There's water features there. And then uh, Whitmore Wash is where many trips end at mile 188. It goes on longer than that, but that's a very common trip length. Okay. So after that first case was reported, the outbreak, uh, as you saw in the timeline, kept getting larger and larger. Um, and we couldn't track it down to a single source. Uh, was it food? Was it person to person? Was it sewage? Was it contact surfaces? Um, on here, I showed that we had uh, another issue on 5-6 on May 6 with two boats, another one on 5-13 with 12 passengers affected on 5-9, 5-10, another on Five, nine, and we were really starting to be concerned, like what was going on in the canyon? We didn't know. Um, we were looking at things like the um, water systems in the canyon. We were looking at the central septic systems and wastewater systems in the canyon and wondering if something had gone wrong. We were looking at the food systems and wondering if something was wrong with that. Uh, we were checking it just general health of staff and, and the boat crews. And we were just really trying to figure out what, why was this year so different? And we didn't get any immediate answers. So within a few weeks, we had multiple trips reporting neuro and approximately 100 people infected. And again, you know, we I've tried to block out most of the names of the trips here or the river guide companies. Um, these are the dates when we were notified, the trip starts, dates, dates. All of them started from Lee's Ferry. Um, these are the end dates. If they had an exchange, um, this is on here, but some had no exchange and still had large numbers of people getting sick. Uh, this one in particular on May 5th took off from Lee's Ferry. And the earliest symptoms were on May 5th. They had 29 illnesses on that one boat trip. There was no exchange date. So it was, you know, even at this time, just a mystery to us, which was difficult because when something like this happens, you want to find out what the problem is and correct it as soon as possible. So I think that there was a lot of us that were just not getting a whole lot of sleep at this time and really trying to figure out as best as we could how we could assist in public health. Uh, and then something really shocking happened around May 16th, hikers were reporting norovirus. And this was a huge game changer for us because up until that point, it had been contained to the river and to boat trips. 
and we could not understand what had happened, that it had crossed some chasm, and now hikers who were not related to boat trips at all were getting norovirus. So on May 16th, we had 11 commercial river trips that reported GI illnesses, one non-commercial private trip, um, three additional private trips, one Grand Canyon research trip, and now we had four hikers reporting neurovirus. We called the CDC on May 16th, 2022, because at that point um, we felt that it could infect many people in the canyon. And we didn't know the source. We didn't know how to stop it. And it seemed to be spiraling out of control. So at that point, we just wanted to get as much help as possible, as many boots on the ground, and people who dealt with this every day to help us figure this out. Um, also on May 16th, we got very busy with our communications folks. Uh, the National Park Service and Coconino County each released a press release um, to let people know who are either already had trips planned for the canyon or even if they were just stopping in and doing something kind of spontaneously that we were experiencing higher than normal um, levels of gastrointestinal illness. And if you are with a small county government, and from the, the looks of some of the surveys yesterday, we've got a lot of people here from small county governments. I would say that I would never have expected to be involved in a investigation this large with so many players. Um, and I think that starting from this point on, it gets really important for everyone because you may have to take these steps at some point. You may have to reach out to the CDC and ask for help. You may need to um, create a press, press release or work with a, other entities to create a press release and warn people. Um, these are also part of the FDA standards. This is standard five. I will go into that a little bit more in detail, um, but I found that that standard extremely helpful um, as I was going through this as a guide of things that I could do to be helpful. So issuing a press release, super important to just let people be aware um, so that that way they can make a choice if they do not want to put themselves in harm way, harm's way. Okay, so I'm joking and saying at this time we all freaked out. We kind of did for a minute, um, but what we really did was just really get to work. And, and I cannot emphasize enough, this was a huge team that did this. I'm um, very grateful to be able to give this presentation, but this is the result of so many people's work and I am just a small part of it. Uh, the Office of Public Health was involved with Ronan King, uh, Chris Klein, Maria Saeed, Stephanie Campbell, and Hasna Karim. Um, folks from the concessions stand showed up and really put out a lot of information, put up flyers to let people know what was going on. Our Coconino County Health Department was involved and Matt Moyer from our epidemiology department, communicable disease. Marat Gebhardt just worked her heart out on this. Um, certainly Mary Ellen, Nigel Jones, Wendy Moyer did a great job with environmental health, um, going out and inspecting the river warehouses, taking samples and taking a lot of leadership in the field. The CDC was amazing. Um, I, working with them was such a pleasure. Uh, they have sh shared slides. Laura Calderwood was amazing um, and just super helpful with samples and providing guidance. Um, the state of Arizona showed up for us consistently. Uh, Connor Fitzgerald and Jolie Weiss. And again, I apologize if I'm missing anyone from the state of Arizona. I think that some other folks may have participated and I wasn't able to get everyone's name. So my apologies, I do not mean any offense. Uh, Dr. Gerba from the state lab actually analyzed our samples 
and was able to show us um, whether things were positive or not. And we're also super grateful to him. Um, I know this is kind of small, but I just kind of wanted to show you one of the next steps that we did right around May 16th is to break everybody up into tasks and roles so that we wouldn't be stepping all over each other and just going crazy. And so the Office of Public Health had certain roles and things that they did. And we, we listed specifically what they would work on. The Grand Canyon uh, National Park Service had certain things that they would do around education and flyers, uh, Coconino County HHS. Everybody had things to do and we broke it down into even into epidemiology, communicable disease and environmental health. Our communication person, Trish Lees, um, did a great job getting the word out to the public and the CDC um, had certain tasks, uh, lots of data, lots of gathering of data to try and find out what was going on. And that's also when things got a little bit more helpful and ADHS also played a huge role. So if you have something like this happen, I highly advise that you do that. Um, break it down into roles and separate it. And then we wound up meeting, I think at the height of it, we were meeting uh, two to three times a week virtually. Um, and some folks were uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, some folks were in Atlanta. Um, some folks were here in Arizona. So there was time issues and time differences, but we made it all work. We were meeting three times a week at some point, And we just had that much new information happening all the time that we had to do that. Uh, of course, there was emails and texting and things like that in between. So some of our early hypotheses were, uh, why, you know, why was this happening? Introduction, uh, introduction of Noro from the community when people came on board at the beginning of, uh, or the exchanges, I mean, that they, some some folks were coming, they're sick, person to person spread. If one person's ill, then it's a small boat. It's highly likely that other people are going to get sick on the boat. Contaminated food, um, although they were using major suppliers, um, there was little pre-prepared -pre food. So we did want to look at the food and, and try and exclude that, make sure that, you know, it wasn't something else. We thought it was neurovirus. We thought it was neurovirus, um, excuse me. Um, but we didn't know for sure at that point. So contaminated food, contaminated drinking water from the river, not ad adequately chlorinated or disinfected, uh, potentially um, food preparation issues. We wondered if maybe that the um, river guides had gotten ill and then they were you know, preparing food and then making the customers ill. Um, fomite transmission from boats and, and water spigots, environmental contamination from beaches, waste left on beaches, um, wastewater plants, things of that nature. But we didn't know. So we were really just checking into all of these things. Okay, this is a form um, that we gave to River Guides and we asked that they fill out for everyone who became ill on the trip. And I will say not, you know, certainly not everyone who was ill in the Grand Canyon filled out one of these forms, but we tried to get as much data as we could. So there's certainly some personal information on there, male or female, um, where they, what their home address was, um, what, kind of, what, what kind of physical symptoms they were experiencing. And that was really the start of where we were getting meaningful data. Okay, um, we checked menus and food sources, even you know outside of where they were preparing 
food was maybe was it coming to these folks already contaminated with something so we tried to look at everything that they were serving and then see if there was any um any alerts on any of these foods and we didn't find anything we did check the water sources um, there's a couple places where you can get potable water in the canyon we also checked the wastewater plant everything seemed to be functioning normally we didn't see anything unusual um, if anything if it could have been fomite transmission at, at where water di distribution was um, and we definitely had the canyon step up uh, cleaning those cleaning and sanitizing those areas okay so here's the question here's where it gets fun how do we know it's neurovirus? <laughs> All right, samples. Uh, you may not be aware that fecal samples need to be taken and who takes them? We do. <laughs> you didn't know that was part of your job description. So this brave soul is Marette Gebhardt and uh, she works in communicable disease. And usually when we do this, we rotate it through epi, communicable disease and environmental health so that not one entity has to do all of these because um, it's not a favorite task for anybody. And these are ammo cans. And you'll see here uh, that there's some blue tape on this one. And if there's an illness in the canyon, um, well, first of all, let me backtrack just, in, just a little bit. These cans are called groomer, groovers, and they are used for people to go to the bathroom in. Um, there's not facilities in the canyon, and um, this is actually an improvement I've heard because people used to not use anything to take this out of the canyon at all. So these are now used... Um, for people to use the restroom in. They're called groovers because originally they didn't use the toilet seat on them and it left two grooves in your backside. <laughs> um, and when people get sick in the canyon, the procedure is that you put a tape or a chalk mark or something on these cans so that we know which, one, which cans are highly likely um, going to be infected with some kind of a virus or bacteria. So when we go out and, and look at these and take samples, we use the best precautions that we can, gloves, masks, gowns. Um, and also you have to be very careful when you're opening them up because you're at a different altitude. Uh, the altitude in the canyon is quite low. Um, the altitude in Flagstaff is around 7,000 feet. So um, a lot could happen when you open up those cans. A lot of unpleasant things could happen. So again, um, the explanation of the groover and how it got its name and the marking with the tape and taking a sample. This is how it looks out in the field when people are camping and the river guides are setting this up. Sandy, they put a toilet seat on there. Uh, yes, Lysol. Um, probably not, let, I, I imagine not a lot of people are really expecting that. They might be a little shocked when they see it, but it's worked pretty well overall. Okay, so how many samples did we take? We took about 60. Um, and as you can see, the dates here, many of them were positive, uh, some were negative, and we actually had two different genotypes of neurovirus. So that is how we got conclusive proof that we were working with neurovirus.
Okay. Education and prevention. Um, we realized because we were having difficulty in tracking down the ultimate cause of the, the norovirus, or you know, we may not ever. Um, the reality was the best way we had of stopping this or minimizing it was education and prevention. So we started putting out lots of flyers. Um, people, uh, the park guides gave them out. They were posted, posted in restrooms to remind people to wash their hands. We also worked very much with the river companies. This is also um, their livelihood and they didn't want to see this happen for the summer. So they were really invested in wanting, you know, making sure that people were as safe as possible and wanting to see that this was stopped. Um, so we started uh, doing symptom screening and usually just to let you know, to be fair, um, I think that the river companies do a fairly good job of this. They will ask people three days before they even, before the trip even starts, they ask three days, they get in touch with everyone three days beforehand and say, are you having any symptoms? Are you feeling well? Do you have a sore throat? Are you feeling ill? Um, and then they are asked again when they show up for the trip, are you feeling well? Are you feeling ill? Do you have any symptoms? So I think you know, there is always that screening. It was done even more so um, during this period. No exchanges occur if there was illnesses on the boats. Um, if there were was an illness, uh, they separated the sick and healthy people to the extent possible. Uh, clear direction on the need to chlorinate drinking water and not just filter. As I said, this turned out to be a pretty big deal. Um, because what we found was um, adding to the problem and likely the issue with the campers or the hikers um, is that people were filtering their water, but they were not chlorinating their water. And so they, you know, what is happening is people were getting sick in the river water. Um, they were vomiting and defecating into the river. And then that would float downstream. Hikers, it's a standard practice. You, you really can't take enough water into the canyon when you're hiking. You really rely on getting water from the river in the canyon. And so it's standard that you take some type of filter um, into the canyon with you and filter water and then drink it. Uh, many people do not like the taste of chlorine and so they skip that step or they think that the filter is enough. Um, and I, we're not 100% sure that that was the cause of the transmission for the hikers, but we're, I think that that's a pretty good guess. Um, and, you know, same thing on the boats. So um, they take, as you saw, up to 29 people uh, on those boats, and they couldn't possibly put enough water on those boats um, for 29 people for 10 days or two weeks or as long as they go out. So they have to filter water. Um, and so they, you know, the crew does filter water and they do chlorinate the water for their guests. Um, but sometimes the crew doesn't chlorinate the water for themselves. Um, they go out often during the summertime. There's many boat trips a day. Um, and so for them to have that much chlorine in their system, some folks, some river guides just don't like it. It is possible that river guides became ill from the water um, that was non-chlorinated and then passed it on to some of their customers. But again, um, lots of opportunity to get Noro out there. I don't think that there was just one smoking gun um, so anyway, we did lots of education um, and also uh, both like preventative uh, education in the restrooms and about hand washing, um, just about neuro in general and the park. And then also, you know, what, if someone was sick, then we looked at exclusion, separating them as much as possible for the rest of the trip, separating the, you know, who, who used what bathroom facilities or who, who was where on a boat. Um, 
And, and that's pretty much the best they can do for norovirus. It's highly unlikely that they're going to airlift someone out of the canyon. Um, and folks just have to be as safe as possible for the rest of the trip. Okay, so this is really small, but it's just an illustration. Um, on average, throughout the summer season, five to six boat trips go out per day, per day. So, you know, that early in the season with that many people getting sick, we were, we were super concerned. Um, you know, because we knew it was a long season and every day, you know, if we got five boats that were affected, you know, we knew that tomorrow there was going to be another five and, and we just didn't see an end to it for a while there. And it, it, it was extremely concerning. Uh, again, we worked with the we worked with the riverboat companies and we gave them a lot of information on how to protect the guests. Um, and we just worked on education and we thought that that would be the best thing that we could possibly do. We did find some suspects with the data, um, again, with the, with the state and with the CDC and with our great CCHS team, um, we found some suspects and one of them was at mile 88. Phantom Ranch and water. So again, taking a look at this, remember mile zero at Lee's Ferry, 88 is Phantom Ranch where there's just a lot of activity going on and mile 188 at Whitmore Wash, just as a reminder. So we're going to get into a little bit of the data now. As that started to come in, we found, you know, we were able to find out what a little bit more of what was happening. And we we put we we collected most of the favorite stops that people that that the river guides made. And then we got the mile markers, and then we started collecting where were people getting sick the most often. And some of the ones that are flagged here, um, 29 people sick here, 29 people sick here, and another 29 people sick here. And we're seeing it at Schist, mile 96. And here we're seeing Phantom Ranch, Boat Beach, mile 88. And here we're seeing Grapevine, mile 81.7. And so, you know, we started to think again, um, this was highly likely that maybe one person got on that was sick and it took two, two to three days for them to have symptoms. And by that time they were giving it to other people. Um, so that's certainly a possibility. The water is also certainly a possibility. Whatever it was, they were floating down the river for a couple days um, before lots of people started to experience symptoms. Um, to a lesser degree, some other trips, um, but definitely heavily favored this area of 88, 89 um, through 90. Um, is where we saw the most people getting ill. Okay. So again, we updated and streamlined the hypothesis. Um, people were filtering that water, but not sanitizing it with chlorine. Uh, around Phantom Ranch, there was a spike of human contact with fomite contact. And again, there's a lot of beaches there. People camp there. Um, there's water features there. Um, could have, could have been, could have been a lot of things. Okay, uh, this is another interesting slide. It's showing the number of illnesses total, um, and the mile marker down here again with those 80 to 90 playing heavily. Uh, the green are the original number of people that they knew were sick on the trip. And the, the total number here, 15. So for, for example, on this one, 
Uh, 16 people became sick on this trip total, um, but four were sick originally. And so that was helpful to us to look at that as well. How did this spread? Okay. We looked at, you know, how did this work out with crew and passengers and overall? Was it the crew getting sick and passing it on to the passengers? Again, also not really conclusive. I think it was kind of coming from all directions. Um, we can see on this one trip K that there was three crew members total and all three got ill. Um, there was another one here where there was seven crew and five became ill. But if we go over and look at the amount of passengers here, only 17% of the passengers got sick on this trip where there was 71% of the crew that was ill. Where there was 100% of the ill crew here, only 35% of the passengers became ill. Um, here, the highest number of passengers was on this trip, 84%. And we did have two ill crew passengers. So again, not you couldn't just draw one conclusion from that, but it was interesting to look at that data. Okay, demographics. There was slightly more male than female cases. And it looks like the, the most folks that were affected were 60 to 64. And in general, just older in, than 60. And that makes sense with immune systems. Um, certainly people were affected in all ranges, but the people who were sick the most were 60 and older. Okay. So we've talked about this a little bit. How could this happen? Um, and, and I think certainly there was a lot of causes once people got in the canyon. But, you know, as far as COVID and neuro and other illnesses that happen, my take on it is that people are coming from all over the world to come to the Grand Canyon. It is the trip of a lifetime. They have spent thousands of dollars on a plane trip. Um, they've spent thousands of dollars to go on this boat trip. And if they are feeling, you know, they're in un unfamiliar surroundings, um, they may have picked it up right before they got there. They really may not have symptoms and not be feeling it. But even if they are feeling a sore throat or something, they're probably going to tell themselves that it's nothing because they're really invested in taking this trip. So I, I think that most of us could really understand uh, the human impulse to do this and how this could happen. So if anybody has any ideas on how to solve this, please let me know because this has been one of our biggest challenges. Uh, this did get some national press. It came out in the Washington Post on June 29th, 2022, and also on the Daily Beast. Um, and there was some smaller publications as well. So I wanted to touch again, because there's so many county governments here and other people that work with the FDA. Uh, the FDA standard five is specifically about uh, foodborne illness outbreaks and how to work through those. And if you haven't looked at it before, I feel like it's super helpful. And it was incredibly helpful to me during this event to have something that was written as far as guidance. Um, so some of the things I'm not listing everything in the standard, but things that were incredibly helpful to me during this event, as, especially as a complete noob, um, were having a SOP for the foodborne illness outbreak. How to, you know, like, how are we going to handle this? Uh, part of that SOP is a list of agencies to call. Who can you call during a foodborne illness? If you don't have a list like that, please take some time to make one because it's incredibly important. It's incredibly important that we work together and build relationships and help each other during times like this. Um, to have an MOU 
with epi investigators if you do not, especially if you don't have them um, at your entity, wherever it is that you're working, um, to have, have a program guidance and how to collect information as well as specimens. If you're not quite sure how to collect specimens safely, find out before something like this happens. Because again, I could never imagine that I in a small um, rural community like Coconino County that I would be involved in an investigation that this was that was the size, but it did happen. And this could happen in your community. So figure out beforehand that will be your best friend. Uh, what you're going to do as far as your standard operating procedure. When would you contact the CDC? For us, it was when, you know, it got to hikers and we knew that it was no longer contained and we couldn't understand what was happening or how to stop it. That is when we called the CDC. Have lab support. Um, whoever that is going to be for you, for us, we were lucky enough to have Dr. Gerba, who is awesome. And then how will you handle media and law enforcement? Um, how will you let law enforcement know what's happening? How will you let the media know? Um, do you have media people where you work? And, you know, how would that happen? What would trigger that? So all of these I found to be extremely helpful. And I wanted to share that with you. Okay, so the summary, um, we had 116 cases from the National Park Service case reports, 222 reported cases total from April 22 to July 22, 136 were from commercial rafting trips, 31 from were hikers, and 55 uh, were private rafting trips. And I have no illusions that this is a total number. I'm sure that there were a lot more sick people out there that just didn't report, but these were the folks that, that we actually got some of those slips from uh, case, case inquiries and notes. And these are the folks that we got the data from. Where did it come from? Ultimately inconclusive. There wasn't a single smoking gun. Um, we would suspect that it was person to person transmission, um, also campsites and water faucets and also water filtered, but not chlorinated. So to go over this timeline a little bit more, um, one more time, April 8th, the first case, April 20th, a uh, second river trip is affected April 21st. Uh, weekly teams meetings were set up with the National Park Service and uh, the Office of Public Health Epidemiologists. On May 5th, we had more cases on May 10th. We had five cases in one day. May 16th, four hikers reported GI illness and the CDC was called. Um, on that same day, we had a press release, both with Coconino County and the Park Service. We, we divided our teams um, into roles and tasks to, and really focused on investigation and education. Um, we started epi case control studies. On May 23rd, this is, this is fun. I was actually at a FDA workshop in Tampa. So as this was happening, um, I had already gotten a grant to go to Tampa Bay for an FDA workshop and I wanted to go. Um, I was working this case while I was at the workshop. The, the FDA folks were like super supportive. I worked on it during the evening um, and I talked a lot about standard five while I was there FDA folks were really supportive and gave me a lot of um, just help on how to manage this. And that's also where they asked me to give a presentation to the FDA, which I believe happened in September. Um, and there was 1500 people present for that. And it was really an incredible honor. So again, uh, Catherine, thank you for all your support on that. It was really deeply meaningful. 
On June 10th, there was a town hall with the concessionaires. And I think we may have met with them another time, but you know, we just tried to get out as much information as possible. And we invited all people from the local towns there to participate um, and, and just give them information in case that they were concerned about their livelihoods or drinking the water. Uh, June 23rd, we had at least 23 trips affected um, and hikers, approximately 300 people. On June 7th, we called an end to the, I'm sorry, July 7th, we called an end to the outbreak. Okay, um, so thank you. And we can do question and answer for about six minutes if anybody has anything. And again, I would just really like to emphasize this was a huge group effort and to thank all of these people for their participation um, and everything that they brought to this. And so I am maybe gonna switch back to the thank you slide and we can see if there's any, any questions. Wow, you guys are great. There's awesome questions in here. <laughs> oh, you all are so sweet. I am getting so much love and support in here. You all are just awesome. All right, I'm trying to figure out where to start. Um, it, one question asks, is this adjusted for topography ecosystem in the area? Um, I reflect that our valley of the sun does not have a normal temp for this area, but it's totally different in areas from the Colorado River. So, I mean, that's an interesting question. We, we I don't think at the time that we took uh, temperature into account. Um, but I certainly would like to, and I will suggest that to the CDC and other people, um, because that could have been something that that aggravated or exacerbated some of the conditions. Um, let's see, not as many deaths from new residents um, or visitors compared to residents that have lived here for many years. Uh, also a good point could be that, you know, um, to break that data down a little bit more, I, I think that we could get a lot more from this as well. And I will get, reach back out to Laura Caldwell with the CDC and see what we can do with that. Uh, does change in rainfall specific to the ecosystem, Southern Arizona, EPA, um, affect? I, I think certainly it would uh, because river currents and pace would matter um, if if that if people vomit and um, have excrement in the water then and it's just very still or slow flowing that would matter more than if the water is going through at a higher rate after a rainfall so that's a good point um, let's see just thinking that is now that we have human lab rats adjusted to wearing COVID masks, it is a great chance uh, to create mask wearing to prevent valley fever. Uh-oh, am I on valley fever? <laughs> okay. Um, Elizabeth, I think yeah. some of those questions, <laughs> they, I think they spilled over. <laughs> okay, that's funny. That is funny. Still? <laughs> okay, here's here's one from Wendy. I'm gonna say this is probably okay. All right, uh, maybe unreported, but for the most part, everyone was affected by Noro. Uh, private groups are not mandated to report. That's a good point, Wendy. That is a really good point. And and in general, there was so many more people there affected, and we were lucky to get the data that we got. But it's in no way comprehensive because a lot of people just got sick and went home. Okay. 
how do the demographics of the trip participants stack up to case demographics? Um, I think that they're they're fairly equal. Um, I, I didn't see a lot of whole. Um, I don't see much much different between the two, but again, that is something that we could certainly look at. Um, can you show the SOP and other resources that you have put together based on your experience? Absolutely. Be happy to share any of this with you all. You stated that most people got ill around mile 88. Incubation period for neuro norovirus is 12 to 48 hours. Um, what happened a day or two before Phantom Ranch? So I think, you know, those are great questions. I, I really believe that they were sitting on a boat and it wasn't necessarily it could be a couple of things it could be that that you know people were on a beach before phantom ranch um, and it could be that they were camping out at some place where other people were ill um, 12 to 40, 48 hours beforehand um, it could just be that people were sick on the boat and that they spent time around each other and by mile 88 that they were infected. Do you know any studies done on how far norovirus will travel in the river? No, and I think that that is a great question. And that's one of the unique things about this because we've all heard things about noro in restaurants and we've all heard noro on cruise ships, but this is really unusual. Um, so if anyone knows of any information out, out there, I would love to see it. We actually were looking for some while this was happening. We didn't find much. So if you know of any, I think um, I would also say that there was a few folks that had a published article. And maybe Wendy can pipe in because I think she was one of the folks that got published and in, in what magazine this was in. And it may be one of the first articles um, that talks about the scientific articles that talks about neurovirus and uh, the river. Did you test any of the water filters? Wish I could hit rewind. Yeah, I know. It's so, it's so intense when you are going through this and looking back on it, there's a million things I wish I could have done differently. Um, when you're going through it, I think that there's so much heightened emotion because you just care about people and you are wanting to, you know, make as much change as you can, as rapidly as you can. There's a lot of uncertainty. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know how it's, how long it's going to last. Um, but yeah, um, there's certainly a lot of things that I would like to do, or I will take notes on and how to do differently next time. We did not test water filters, but I thought about that yesterday as well um, when we were seeing that presentation. Good question. Thank you for all the great comments. You all are just super kind. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> uh, someone is saying, this is the third time I have seen your presentation and you have done such a wonderful job each time, changing up the information provided, your focus on different areas uh, of the area, areas of the presentation is expressed on your new information gained. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just, there's a lot of just super positive and supportive comments in there. Thank you. Your team has succeeded, has succeeded in a situational analysis. I agree. I think that they've just hit it out of the park. I'm so proud of everybody who participated in this and certainly um, Coconino County, but really just everybody did an amazing job. And it shows me what people can really rise to um, in a situation that seems impossible, but they really just, everybody hit it out of the park. I think I'm actually over time right now. So I will continue to read these and try and respond, but I don't wanna make the next person super late. Thank you all so much. It was such an honor to be here and I hope you all have a great day and thank you ADHS.
Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining. Um, we do have a break until 10.15, I believe. Um, yeah, 10.15 is when we're gonna start back up. So feel free if you wanna keep answering questions or you can just answer them in the chat. Um, it kind of depends up to you. Okay, I, I'm i gonna take a couple more then. And again, if you all wanna go and take your break, please do. I don't wanna hold you up. Okay. Uh, one says, I have been visiting with the BOR and BLM on the river, the lower Colorado River, uh, to be in testing swimming sites to compile data on E. coli and coliform colonies. This would be a very interesting comparison. Please stay in touch. I would love to find out about your data, and I would love to compare it. I think that'd be incredibly interesting. Thank you. Thanks. I've got like really just great supportive comments here. Um, one question says, were they were there any illnesses of the setup raft teams prior to launch? That is a great question. Um, none that I know of, but I will say that after we found out that this amount of illness was happening, we got very curious if the uh, boats themselves could be um, part of the transmission. And we really asked that they super clean and sanitize these boats. Um, and they did. They, and some of them, they, they rotated and left for a week. Um, and they just wouldn't take them out and reuse them immediately. They sanitized and left them for a week and then would take boats that were left for a week and use those. So that was part of, you know, just trying to remediate, make things better. I think that's mostly the questions. I think that's it, unless I'm gonna go back and, and take some of more, more of the prior speakers' questions. <laughs> hey, again, thank you so much. And Corey, thank you for being a great host. And just uh, thanks, I have enjoyed being a participant and watching this so much. Um, and I look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you, Elizabeth. We really appreciate having you, and we love your um, your presentation style. You always you always make us laugh. So, <laughs> thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. And yeah, we will reconvene at ten fifteen. Um, there is a Slido question that we'll post. You can answer that now, um, but we'll see you in about ten minutes. <laughs>